Hello and welcome to AI Colorado's Virtual Connect. Uh, it is Wednesday, March 27th. Um, I'm not just saying that to remind you what day and uh, month it is, but to note that on uh, March 26th was the first day of the stay-at-home order. So we've had two months now under this uh, new environment of navigating through our time together. And there's been a lot that's happened in those two months uh, between March 26th and May 27th. And we're gonna hear about how the state of Colorado has reacted in those two months and what we have in store for the future as we start to reopen things and transition to a new phase. We're glad you could join us today. Uh, you'll get one learning unit credit for attending today's session. You need to have RSVP'd online via the calendar event. You can see that in the chat function. Uh, and most of you have probably already done this, otherwise uh, you wouldn't have been on the call today, but just in case you haven't, there's a way to, to still do that. Uh, and we'd ask that you please stay through to the end to ensure you receive the full credit for the session. You can also use the Q&A function throughout today's presentation if you have questions for our speakers. Uh, we'll either answer them at the time if we can get it in and it's very uh, appropriate for that particular presentation time point, or we'll have time at the end of the session to um, to capture all of the comments and questions for any of the panelists today. We have three uh, great presenters and we're especially appreciative that they could join us today because I'm sure they have been very busy uh, dealing with all the, uh, the changes that have happened uh, throughout state government. To start off, we have uh, Parker Crow. Hi, Parker. Hello, thanks for having me. Parker is with the Department of Local Affairs for the state of Colorado and he's the budget program manager. He's managed the local government budget program at Dola since 2017. In this position, he provides financial technical assistance to all of Colorado's counties, municipalities, and special districts, and also evaluates local government budgets for statutory compliance. He joined Dola after five years administering federal programs for the Department of Energy and EPA. We also have with us Sherry Giroux. Hello, Sherry. Hi. Someone um, many people in the state of Colorado architecture community know well. She is the state architect of Colorado. That office is statutorily responsible for the administration of state funded planning, construction, energy conservation, and real estate transactions at state agencies and institutions of public higher education. Sherry is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects, is a licensed architect in the state of Colorado, and holds a certificate from the NCIDQ. She's an active member of the American Institute of Architects, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, History Colorado, and Historic Denver. Uh, she is a, also a former state representative and with her husband, Phil, is a partner in Giro and Associates Architects. And finally, we have Catherine Correll. Hi, Catherine. Hi. <laughs> Kat's the Executive Director of Downtown Colorado, Inc. And she's an innovative resource choreographer for local governments, nonprofits, and private businesses, hoping to achieve more with less. She brings broad experience in public-private partnerships, financing strategies, and organizational and partnership structures. Kat is well-versed in professional development and volunteer networks, outreach and engagement, community and economic development, not-for-profit administration, project development management, communications, and establishing collaboration around shared experience and marketing initiatives. So it's a great lineup today. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take some short presentations in turn from each of them. Uh, we'll have some questions afterwards, and then we'll have time for everybody to to uh, have a dialogue and, and do some more digging into the content. To start us off, we're gonna have Parker tell us about uh, a very recent survey that was, that was conducted. Uh, he's nervous because he hasn't presented this before, but he's gonna do just fine and we feel extra special that we are the first audience who gets to see this info. So Parker, uh, take it away. Thanks, Mike, I really appreciate it. This is a great opportunity. Uh, let me just present my screen here. Great, I think that should be sharing. Um, so like Mike said, I am the budget program manager at the Department of Local Affairs. So I've been working with local governments across the state who are dealing with a number of different issues related to the current health emergency and how it impacts their public finance. And like he said, the main topic of today's discussion for, for me and my, my portion of this discussion is um, that we conducted a survey kind of right when, this, when the uh, crisis began looking at the expectations of local governments and the impact on their finances. So just a little bit on Department of Local Affairs, if you're not familiar, just so you know where I'm coming from. 
Um, the Department of Local Affairs is a, is a fairly unique state department uh, around the country where we have a number of different um, points of contact with local governments. It's kind of a liaison between the state government and local government. So I work within the Division of Local Government where we uh, have a number of regulatory filings with local governments and also provide technical assistance on finance and elections and other issues. Um, but you can also see that there's a division of property tax that works with county assessors. Uh, we do a lot of disaster recovery work um, and grants, uh, division of housing and assessment appeals and board of assessment appeals, which works with state assessed property. Um, so it's a diverse department um, within the division of local government where I work. Um, the largest thing that we're known for is grants, the financial assistance. I believe it's about 200 million a year usually um, going out the door from DOLA to local governments for water infrastructure and um, severance tax dollars and, and such like that. Um, I work within local government services where we do more um, compliance related issues around local government budgets and elections as well as a lot of technical assistance to local governments when they have questions. Uh, we have a regional manager staff spread throughout the state. They really are the first point of contact for local governments that if they have an issue that they think DOLA can help them with, they have a good relationship with their regional manager and the regional manager directs them to the right place. And then more recently, the um, Colorado Resiliency Office is within DOLA, which is very important now helping local governments weather storms such as now that don't have to be physical storms. Um, with, with, every, what, with everything everyone's going through now, um, their assistance is greatly appreciated. Um, so those local governments I've, I've mentioned, um, there are more than you may think, uh, about 4,000 active local governments in the state, including counties, municipalities, school districts, and then special districts. Um, the vast majority of the, that count is special districts, such as um, fire districts. Um, you can see close to 2,000 metropolitan districts um, are the most common type of local government in the state. So DOLA was in a pretty good position when this health crisis began to have to put out a survey to our contacts in local governments to, to see where we expect, where they expect, excuse me, um, the financial impact to, to hit. Um, so I will say, um, we, we put out this survey. The survey, um, Mike wasn't quite correct there. This It's not hot off the press. Early April seems like ancient history at this point with it, with it, everyone's learned and been through in the last close to two months at this point. Um, but this is a kind of snapshot of what local governments were expecting, which I think parts could be relevant for this audience. Um, so it was an effort to really just estimate and communicate the impacts that they're expecting. And we will say there's likely s severe underreporting just because it was so early on that people didn't exactly know um, the impact on their on their financial situation due to the due to the health crisis. Um, so who responded? We had 551 total responses. Uh, that's about 13% of all those uh, 4,000 local governments. So count slightly off because local governments um, are for being formed all the time. So I'm not sure when the first data was pulled. Um, and it was fairly representative across the spread of types of local government. The, the majority coming from special districts but then also a fair amount of participation from municipalities and counties. Um, you can see out of the 270 municipalities, 134 responded and out of the 64 counties, 61 responded. So uh, a larger pr proportion of those um, types of entities uh, participated in this survey. So 95% of counties and 50% of municipalities. Um, and within special districts, fire districts, emergency med medical service districts, ambulance districts, water and sewer, health service districts, um, you name it, um, it, pretty fair representation across the board. Um, so the, getting into the results of the survey quickly. Um, one question was what revenue types are you most concerned about a reduction in, what revenue types are you most concerned about a reduction in due to COVID-19 during the 2020 budget year? And again, this is so early on, it's a bit of a guess, um, but nothing too surprising. Um, when you think of the different revenue sources available to a local government, sales tax is typically the most volatile, um, and you see that represented here. Uh, one caveat, um, especially on the special district data, um, special districts tend to get most of their property tax, their, their revenue from property taxes. 
So no surprise that special districts listed property tax as, as the category they're most concerned about. Um, but you can see that sales and use tax was the um, largest concern in counties and municipalities, um, followed by property taxes for counties, and then uh, going through the different types of revenue sources, many use fees and um, other impacts that could that could be affected by it all of the changes in economic activity that have happened in the last two months. Um, summarizing this a little bit, what is the S total estimated revenue decline for each different type of district? And the average um, for counties, or I believe it's totals, it's a sum, not an average. Um, there, it's it's a quite a shortfall, that's no surprise, $683 million identified in this survey. Um, is, a, is a really significant hit to, to a lot of these local governments. On the expenditure side, maybe maybe getting a little bit more relevant to this audience, where, where is, how much hit are they expecting to take based on expenditures related to COVID-19? Um, these are additional spending um, dedicated to COVID-19 related uh, recovery. Uh, I the survey identified $49 million um, spread evenly between the different types of districts. So not only is the revenue taking a significant hit, um, expenses are also increasing in response to the, the public health emergency. Um, digging in a little bit deeper, um, the, what types of additional expenditures do, do these different types of entities expect to uh, incur? Um, you can look through um, a lot of things related to um, expecting staff to, be, to, to become sick. Um, I'm not sure if this survey was updated, whether or not this would still be the number one um, concern since Colorado has been spared perhaps uh, the worst of the damage experienced by others, other states. Um, but that certainly was the, the, was the top concern. Um, medical expenses, staff overtime, uh, they're just looking into, uh, there's a number of categories that you may not think right off the bat. Um, that could be that could represent additional spending related to the to the COVID crisis. Um, so this is the slide that I really wanted to focus on this whole time to to those in the architecture and and development sphere. Um, where do you think expenditures will be cut due to the cuts in um, expected revenue? And number one is capital projects. I think it's no surprise that local governments will be delaying capital projects um, and really only focusing on those projects that um, have a public public health and safety component. Um, they're, with this significant of a decline in revenue, um, we can just expect capital projects to be delayed for um, a, a fair amount of time. Um, beyond that, uh, unknown, there's a lot of uncertainty, I think. Um, Local governments are just still reeling from those top line numbers, declines in revenue. What, where are you going to cut that spending? I think they're still trying to figure that out. Um, as we see in the state state um, government, the General Assembly is back in session this week uh, debating the, the where to cut funds in the state government. That's analogous. Uh, excuse me. That's analogous in the local government sphere as well. Um, parks and recreation, public works, library and cultural programs, public safety across the board, everything that local government does is um, not spared from, from potential cuts. Um, looking at how local governments serve their communities, there's a number of, of ideas out there on how local governments could support uh, their residents with their services, um, but the largest category in this that was responded in the survey was no support. I think that goes along hand in hand with the um, decline in revenue. So there just isn't as much possible, but also that the survey went out to different types of districts that may not have as much of a role in a public health emergency as, as others. So it's hard to ferret that out. Um, suspending ut utility shutoffs, utility late fees waived, offering utility payment plans were the next largest. So those Local governments, such as municipalities or water districts, um, are considering some leniency to their residents, um, which will further 
impact their revenue as the local government. Um, so that really gets to the gets the heart of the the survey. Um, it was early on, like I said. Uh, I think there will probably be more to come, but um, for now, it's it's really just interesting to see how these local governments expect to respond. Um, and I also can't do a a uh, presentation without mentioning the census. It is one of the most important things to be done right now. So please uh, fill out the census yourself and spread the word that the census is still open and it's time to respond. Uh, my contact information is here. Uh, please send me an email if you have any questions. And thanks to AIA for, for having me. Thanks, Parker. This is great information. And yeah, early April does seem like a lifetime ago. Uh, you exactly. mentioned probably, <laughs> Are you planning to be out back out in the field um, with similar questions? Excellent. Uh, uh, are you, do you mean physically back out in the field? Oh, no, I mean uh, <laughs> surveying these. Local okay, people. sure. Yeah, um, yeah that, there's both topics of discussion of, of how much we can get out there and interact with local governments. But there, there have been talks. Um, and there's definitely interest. We're just trying to figure out the you know, kind of lessons learned from the first round of surveys and, and mm -hmm. trying to come up with a plan to, to get some updated information. Do you think that survey results um, will help influence some of the policy decisions as the legislature comes back? I would think so. I think there's just a lot of questions out there um, and, and the General Assembly members um, are highly interested in, in what's going on around the state and, and getting that information from the source is, is a pretty relevant um, piece of information. You got to be pretty pleased with the response rate. I mean, 95% of counties is about as good as you get. That's really broad uptake and geographic diversity. Yeah, I think it speaks to uh, Dolo really just having good, good outreach, uh, good, good relationships out there. Um, and just that's over a number of years and decades of, of good relationships through either the grant side or just mm -hmm. um, the other work that, that my colleagues do around the state. And do you know if there's any CARES Act funding to, because, you know, 683 million down and 49 million up, that, that's a lot of, a lot of hole to fill. So um, there uh, have been some overtime hours worked recently. Um, I forget the exact total, but it's over 150 million that the governor allocated to local governments to be distributed by DOLA. Um, so everyone is trying to figure out exactly what the restrictions on that are and how to distribute that, distribute those funds. And, you know, everyone's hopeful for some, some more federal funds in the future. Sure. Well, it was uh, disappointing, I guess, to see the number one expected cut would be capital projects. Exactly. That's, that's the part for this audience that really um, I thought could be relevant if, if you do any work in the, in the public sector, it's going to be tough um, with those declining revenues to, to undertake a new building project. Yeah, even more than the number two response, which is we really have no idea what we're going to cut, but we, exactly. def and we definitely <laughs> know we're not going to do capital projects. It's sort of like, ooh, that, that hurts a little bit for this audience. But I, I do think that there will be some retrofits to be done. So not a traditional capital project. So we need to build a new police station or a, or a library or a school. But the, the existing buildings that you do have, um, if you're going to open up to the public and have people interact, We'll probably need some work, and, and architects can help uh, make those retrofits effective. So, absolutely, I think there'll be a lot of adaptation um, work, ad ad adapting public space to perhaps a long term, long term change. Okay, well, Parker, we'll come back to you at the end when we bring the full panel on board and and uh, a way to kick us off. We appreciate that. Um, and so, our next presenter is going to be. Catherine with uh, DCI. So we'll ask for Kat to bring her video up and, and share her presentation. Hi there. Hi. Okay. We are ready to hear what, what you know is going on around the state of Colorado with the communities that you interact with. Thanks, yeah. Kat. Thanks so much for having me, and, um, and that was a great presentation, Parker, thank you. Um, so, um, my name is Catherine Perrell, as um, introduced, and I am with Downtown Colorado, Inc. Uh, we specifically work with commercial districts um, and really place-based community and economic development. 
Um, so our membership is the business improvement districts, downtown development authorities, urban renewal authorities, as well as local governments. Um, and specifically, we work with the entities within the governments who have um, been dedicated to commercial districts and um, downtown areas. Um, so it's a particularly challenging group because we're all about place and a sense of um, gathering and community is really how all of our districts survive. Um, so our membership is, is particularly um, at risk during all of this. Um, okay. So, um, so for today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges that we see, the champions who emerged, um, the commercial district responses, the recovery framework that we've um, put in place and we're continuing to work on, and then some of the reopening strategies that we are um, investigating. And I'll, I'll try and do all of this within my time frame. Um, so the biggest challenge I think that we are finding is the diversity within our state. I think it's both um, it's both our strength and our challenge. But the fact that there are so many different economies and so many different types of communities, some of them, you know, completely uh, focused on agriculture, some of them completely focused on tourism. So as we all know, their economies are very different and the economic impacts of this are going to um, impact everyone certainly, but some of them will have the ability to come back and work on different types of projects, whereas others um, may be stalled and have to reinvent, which is another thing that Colorado is well known for. Um, so from our Downtown Colorado Inc. side, we, um, we were actually poised to have our conference on April 14th through 17th. And so we were kind of in a good place, oddly, to respond when everything shut down. Um, we kicked off commercial district COVID calls or COVID-19 response calls on um, that really the first week that everybody was home and those take place every Thursday at 9 a.m. We dive into a whole range of things like how do you engage with your community during COVID um, shutdown? How do you, um, how are people planning for outdoor seating? Um, this tomorrow we're looking at sales tax um, and our, our sales tax fragility, basically. And what does that mean for us as a state as we're trying to respond to this? Um, we've also put together a, a pretty detailed Google sheet that has all of the different communities and what resources they've put together. So looking at their marketing campaigns, looking at the grants that they have available, looking at all of the different pieces that have um, been put together in response. So we're trying to capture the story of what Colorado communities are doing. Um, we also did a statewide survey. Well, we did three. Um, we had one looking at the impacts on business, one looking at impacts on nonprofit entities like chambers of commerce or economic development councils throughout the state, and then one looking at local governments in terms of business improvement district, downtown development authority, and local um, and urban renewal authorities because these districts often rely both on property tax and sales tax. And so um, we thought that that would be an important thing to understand as those are our members. And then as I mentioned, the commercial district recovery framework um, is a, t a tool that we put together. It looks at three phases. So the stabilization phase, recovery phase, and the new normal. And it's really looking at how can we create a path and structure discussions um, and create a dynamic tool for all of our communities to use. Um, so what we're seeing from downtowns and commercial districts around the state is that they have been able to put together additional financial support um, specifically in areas where they do have a business improvement district, downtown development authority or urban renewal, they've been able to partner and bring together partners from the city, 
from the Chamber of Commerce, from um, the county, from different entities to say, okay, we're gonna do our own grant program, we're gonna do our own loan program. In areas that have business improvement districts, some of them have decided to give back the assessment that they collect. So um, instead of keeping that funding for this year to do events, they're redirecting that money back to businesses and property owners. Um, they've looked at alternative support, like um, how can you um, help, actually help the businesses apply for the, the federal aid or other types of support that are out there, putting together online marketing so that you can have an online presence where you haven't had it before. Um, as well as purchasing um, distancing tools and measures, protective gear, um, plexiglass, uh, the little footprints to show you where to stand on the sidewalk, all of that stuff. Um, these districts are very active in that. Um, in places that don't have those districts, we've been working specifically with local governments and pulling together task forces so that they can have representatives from business, from chamber, from the city and, and putting those together and then helping them focus on adaptations and innovations. And we've seen some really cool stuff um, from a lot of our, our members. I would say the ones that have these formalized districts have kind of been the strongest in their response. But an example is um, Colorado Springs and Manitou Springs. From downtown Colorado Springs, they have a corridor and it goes through old Colorado City to Manitou Springs. They typically have a virtual, uh, they have a first Friday and they moved it to be a virtual first Friday. And in, on the first one, I think they sold 20,000 in products, in art, in three hours or something like that. So really helping the businesses to still have sales and looking at what that looks like. Um, and then thinking about adaptations and innovations, um, specifically, I think for, for this group, it, it's of interest to think about how to um, expand the area that you can sell in. So um, thinking about that curbside pickup or parklets and, and designing um, cool physical spaces that allow people to have that distance. Um, and so some of the reopening strategies that we are employing as we're getting ready to really kick this off and in the communities that have variances um, is really understanding the clear metrics as to, you know, how, how open can we be? What do we have to monitor? When do we know if we have to shut down again? Um, strengthening safety measures. So making sure that the safety measures are in place, but even more so thinking about not more so, but evenly thinking about the perception of safety. And so, for example, having um, posters like this one on my slide that show what the businesses are doing in terms of safety so that the community feels safe as well. Thinking about the different cost sharing that they can put in place, um, celebrating the adaptation and innovation, and then expanding the physical boundaries. And I do think that for this group, really thinking about that retrofit and what are we going to do with off Office space, how are we going to potentially have more shared spaces where you might share a kitchen, but all of the restaurants could have outdoor seating. Um, a lot of those pieces and retrofitting the built environment is what our districts are looking at next. Um, these are just a couple of events we have coming up and that is it. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. That's some great stuff. And I know you've got your finger on the pulse of a lot of people around the state. So it's great to hear. Um, I was, I definitely noted the concept you mentioned earlier about the different economic sectors and how it's, it's not going to be a uniform effect. You know, my, my family are all farmers, so they're pretty good at social distancing and they're still going to have a market for their product. You know, they're in the field and sitting on a tractor most of the day. Um, but if you're in the hospitality or tourism or entertainment business, it's totally different. Um, so, you know, it's not a one size fits all approach. Yeah. So um, one thing that, that struck me was that you've got um, so many business districts that you work with and you're helping to, to weave the best practices together and share information and connect them. Are you, are you gratified even though it's a negative, um, environment 
that they're finding more value in, in connecting and being part of your group? Yeah, I would, I actually, you know, while nobody would have wished for this, I think that it is, um, it is presenting an opportunity to uh, really embrace the local, right? So as soon as we sort through the supply chain issue, um, the fact that people are turning to their local districts, they're turning to their local communities, they're really relying on one another more. Um, if that can also translate to dollars being spent locally, then I think it is, it is inevitably going to be good for that sense of community and sense of place on the whole. Um, there's, there's a raging debate right now about are people just going to get used to shopping online or will they revert back to, you know, really relying on your local community. And I think that, um, I think that we're definitely seeing that because you can only do so much through your screen before you, I, I personally get a headache. So I'm sure, I'm sure other people are too. Yeah, and you really you start to realize what makes your place unique. It's it's not it's certainly not online shopping, and it's not the big box chain retailers. It's it's what you see on Main Street, and and people are hyper aware when they see that people are closed until further notice or or going out of business. That it changes the nature of your community when those aren't there. Yeah. Are you um. Are you seeing, you hinted at this a little bit in your presentation, that, that there's a new concept of placemaking that might come out of this where we, um, where we use public spaces in a different way or, or um, outdoor spaces differently than we have before? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that there is, it, you know, it's funny because people keep saying this hasn't created new things. It's just ex accelerated existing trends. And so the idea of food trucks or parklets or um, these different ways where you can actually bring your business out onto the street and kind of create that community feeling. Um, I think that those things are being accelerated. I also think the idea of looking at our public spaces and seeing, you know, like there's all of these conversations right now about how do we have safe play. So people are kind of inventing different rooms or different dividers, different spaces that can be fun and engaging, but can also allow people to get out into the community. Um, so we're seeing everything from, you know, considering like parklets all along the street to, um, you know, having sort of like a, um, like a private dining ability, like out in the middle of a square. And, and so I think if, if I was an architect and I often wish I was, I would be, <laughs> I would be thinking about how can you create both that intimacy and that sense of community in the built environment, um, whether it be sort of redesigning, redesigning the outdoor seating options or redesigning the indoor um the the division of of spaces and and how um how those pieces are coming together but i do think that there's going to be a huge push on that and then office space everybody is wondering you know what's going to happen with office space next i uh, uh, it sounds like there's um potentially going to be more need for light manufacturing over office right and so you know how do we make those changes to our our built spaces. And um, one thing on the conversation from before, um, with our downtown development authorities and our urban renewal authorities, a lot of them are actually using their funds to step up construction. Mm -hmm. So using this as a time to do more construction, getting those projects done, um, thinking about the things that you can do to keep money infused into the economy. Um, so while I think on the whole local governments are pulling back on that there are entities like ours that are like the liaison between the city and the private sector. And they're very much pushing forward and trying to keep that money flowing and um, adapt while they're moving. Yeah, and thankfully a lot of those special assistance funds are, are dedicated. You know, they have not only dedicated revenue streams, but dedicated uses that they can't easily be pivoted to, to something else. So yes. that's, that's a good note to end on. And um, We've got over 2,000 architects across the state and every kind of community. So if, 
if you know of any, any need that we can meet from your members, please let us know. Uh, we can find a, a fit to help them out. <laughs> um, and you probably get the prize today for the best um, home office. <laughs> the best what? Home. The best home office. You're making us. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, thank uh, you. Next, we have Sherry Juro. So, Sherry, uh, if she comes back up, we'll let her talk about what's happening with the Office of the State Architect. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Mike. Thank you very much for asking me. This is very nice. Thank you. Uh, Megan's going to show the, the slides for me, and thank you very much, Parker, Catherine, Megan, and Mike. This is a, this is a great program. So as a state architect, um, my office, the Office of State Architects, statutorily is responsible for the administration and state-funded planning, construction, energy conservation, and real estate transactions at, at all state agencies and institutions of higher education around Colorado. We also uh, establish the policies and the procedures, and we provide technical support and training. Um, and we, we recommend the annual controlled maintenance statewide budget and the state agency capital construction budget requests um, to the governor's office of state planning and budgeting. And we also serve as a, a, a technical export for the capital development committee um, of the general assembly. Um, Megan, could you go to the first slide? Thank you. So primarily what we've been doing since, actually since March 11th, um, the, because the Office of State Architect has purview all, over all state buildings and our real estate division, we've basically been working um, with the Office of Energy or Emergency Management and with the Colorado uh, Department of Homeland Security we were folded in very early on um, to identify properties that could be used for different alternative care facilities. Originally when um, in March, what they were thinking, and this is a combination of um, medical, medical experts at the Anschutz Medical Campus and the uh, CDC and the Office of Homeland Security, they predicted we would have two waves. Um, of the pandemic. The first wave was supposed to appear late April, early May, and then they expected another one to um, appear about late October, early November. Because of the governor's executive order and his emergency shelter at home uh, actions, what we saw was um, that first surge or, um, or peak uh, was much milder because basically everybody was home and they were doing what they should be doing and and saving lives. So they have since then um, changed their prediction. Um, and and those of you that are familiar with the Spanish flu um, at the beginning of the 20th century know that that actually occurred in three waves and that the second wave or the second surge was the most deadly. The first was rather light. The second was much, much more intense. And then the third was light. So I'm not saying that's what will happen with this, but this is kind of, we only have history to look back on. So what the Office of State Architect was charged with was to negotiate all the leases and obtain all the leases for the sites that um, are being used as alternative care facilities. We currently have five sites that um, uh, our office is engaged with the management of or the construction of. The first two sites were tier three hospitals. And when they look at the, um, the, uh, the tier of care, um, and this is based on the Army Corps of Engineers um, recommendations and information, tier one would be you're in ICU and they're keeping you alive, but it is a bit of a struggle. Tier two, you're in the hospital, you do have COVID, but um, you're, you're, you're getting better. Tier 2.5 would be you're someplace between you're getting better or maybe you're in some type of step down facility so that uh, you can be taken care of as a hospital setting would with less amount of care, but you are basically out of the hospital system to allow for other people that need greater amount of care. And then tier three hospitals would be those that are well on their way to recovery. They're gonna be there for probably about two weeks. And then the tier four facilities 
um, would be if you were in a hotel and you were quarantined or isolated for the two week time period before you could go home. So based on that four tier structure, um, the state of Colorado engaged in developing properties that were tier three, um, which included the Colorado Convention Center and the Ranch Event Center up in Loveland. Those were built by the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, Hensel Phelps did the construction of the, um, the Convention Center in Denver with Davis Partnership as a lead architect. The Ranch Event Center was built in Loveland by the Army Corps of Engineers with J.E. Dunn doing the construction and A.E. Com acting as the architect of record. Um, and these facilities were stood up in approximately four weeks and um, the budgets varied. Uh, the convention center budget originally was about $40 million and about halfway through we stepped down the numbers and the build out. So all told, I think it was about a $20 million construction. The ranch event center, again, that was, that was stepped down and, um, and it, it was about half the cost that it, it was really originally projected. Next slide, please. So then the tier point 2.5 hospitals, which the Office of State Architect were directed to build out on our own. And, and those of you that are familiar with our office know that um, we typically ask, act as an oversight. We don't typically in, engage in construction, but um, we're in an emergency and we did, and that's what we've done. So we, there were three sites that we had been working on. The first site is St. Anthony North, which is a Centura project up in Westminster. And um, that will provide approximately 78 beds. Um, oh, and I meant to tell you that uh, the convention center was scheduled to provide 2,000 beds and it has been stepped down to provide um, 1,000. Um, and likewise, on the, the ranch, it was stepped down to, to provide less than what was originally planned. And we just cut the budgets back because we were hopeful that we're not gonna need the facilities and we didn't wanna sp spend valuable state resources on something that may not be needed. So the second of the two 2.5 hospitals is St. Mary Corwin, which is down in Pueblo. And that will provide about um, 100 to 125 beds. And then the third is Western Slope Memory Care in Grand Junction, which will provide about 50 beds. And again, those uh, facilities are currently under construction. We should be done with all of our construction on those three facilities um, in June. Mortensen um, and Davis Partnership helped us with the Centura St. Anthony's North. Mortensen and RTA Architects helped us with St. Mary Corwin in Pueblo. And FCI Constructors and the Blythe Group in Grand Junction helped with the Western Slope Memory Care. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did was when we were looking at the 2.5 conversions, those are existing hospitals that had been vacated um, for one reason or another. The two Centura projects, um, they, they, there are some portions of the buildings that are active, but these were not. So our, our goal was to go in, do needs assessments, and then um, it was a, a design build project. So we were, we were basically designing as we went along assessment and then developing construction costs. Next slide, please. So at the convention center, um, when we worked on that project, that obviously was a much larger project. It started earlier and um, it actually was the first to be complete, completed. Um, during the course of that time, less than 30 people involved um, were not Colorado residents, and which was an amazing. The workforce was incredible. The work they did was incredible. They were truly, everyone that's worked on this has been actively engaged in saving lives, either for, through prevention or for, um, through delivery of care. Next slide, please. Just as, as another point, we were working hand in hand, besides with the Army Corps of Engineers, we've been working with the Colorado National Guard. They've been invaluable partners with us in making sure that we have the manpower um, and the expertise to move very quickly on these projects. Next slide, please. I, we had a tour of the facility very early and um, it was not quite completely uh, constructed. They will be setting the facilities up so that they will be taking intake of patients, I believe between 10 and six, and then um, they, the facility will be shutting down during the night. So there was a, there's a, peer, a, a 
procedure to intake a, a patient from the different area hospitals. These are all support facilities for the hospitals. Um, since the surge is predicted in September now, um, that's when they are predicting the ICU surge, and that's when they predict that they'll need to vacate some of the hospitals of patients that can be moved to um, um, a step-down facility so they can make, make room for the, the sick. Next slide, please. Um, this is obviously, it's a, a little bit skewed, but this is a uh, panorama view of, of the facility. When you walk into the Denver Con Convention or the Colorado Convention Center, you would walk in through the intake, and this would be the first view that you would see. Those copper lines that you're looking at are basically, that's our oxygen supply. When they set the walls up for these um, projects, they, it's a metal stud construction, and they did not uh, shoot into the concrete. They basically used um, double stick tape to put the, the base plate down, and then they built it up and they, um, they basically reinforced the walls until the walls were all tied together in the structure. They did an, an incredible job and the facility is really, it's, um, it's quite amazing. Next slide, please. One of the things that we needed to do was to make sure that not obviously we had the signage that we um, adhered to all fire and life safety. And um, as you're going through the convention center, it's very easy to get lost in the, lay, in the um, maze of rooms. So um, they, they were very good about helping Kelly code, not only for the use of the caregivers, but also for the patients that will be there. The convention center um, rooms are approximately 10 by 10. Uh, the rooms built at the, uh, the ranch are eight by 10. Next slide, please. As you're looking down, you see a, a patient corridor view. The, um, the systems were as simple as possible. Nurse call bot buttons are basically pulling a cord on the wall and um, it will light up a light outside your room. And uh, the nurses station about halfway down the corridor would then see, they'd look out, see lights, and then that's how they would attend um, to a patient at the convention center. The, the ranch used a slightly different system, but basically um, the, the outcome is the same. Next slide, please. This is a view of a patient room. You'll, you'll see these are really very simple. Um, the, the rooms at the convention center, like I said, they were 10 by 10. When the sheet rockers went in and they um, applied the rock, there was absolutely no waste because they were able to um, utilize all of the, uh, the sheet rock, the cuts, all of them. In fact, as they were sh sheet rocking these, um, the areas in the convention center, um, the rockers had a, a, a competition to go going and they were trying to figure out who would be the first sheet rocker that would team that would be able to uh, build a hundred rooms in a day. There was an incredible, an incredible camaraderie and an incredible sense of urgency and care and really love of Colorado as they were building this. Um, the cots themselves are adjustable up. Obviously, we don't have our, our bedding on this, but it's a very simple, simple room. Um, the area on the wall about halfway up to, on the right side of the bed is your oxygen supply. There is literally a coat, a, um, a coat hook on the wall to help with um, hoses and just to direct. And then, of course, the IV stand. Next image, please. This is an area I, I joined to two pictures together, so it's a little skewed, but it's basically the view of the not quite finished locker rooms for staff. The sink units that you see were, were built by, um, they were designed and built as independent units and they, they haven't, they have their, they're supplied with water through the system, but they basically have a, a pump and a, and a drain system that makes them, you could put them in the middle of a meadow and they would work. Uh, they're pretty amazing. Um, so anyway, next slide, please. These units were, they're basically Connex containers that were um, converted into showers. And those, those um, units are, uh, if you step inside the unit, it, it has vinyl flooring, it has a shower compartment, and then there is um, a dressing area beyond. Uh, they're very simple. They were built very, very quickly. 
and the state of Colorado. It, it, what will be interesting is to see what we end up doing with a lot of this material when we're done. Next slide, please. There were portions in both facilities, both the Colorado Convention Center and the ranch that were not completed. We got to a point in the projects where they were watching the numbers. Um, what they have determined is they need three cycles and they're three two week cycles to determine how the inspection, in, the infection spreads. And so over the course of the time that we began construction and we began construction approximately the first of April to the end of April, they, they determined that the infection rate was slowing, that we looked like we were not going to need to spend the amount of money. So this area was, was left um, not completed. And, the, and basically the area that's not completed is in various stages of construction and would be about um, another thousand beds. Next slide, please. There's areas here you can see that's the way we, um, those areas would need to be done, but that's the framing as it stood up as in the beginning. Next slide, please. More areas, all of the electrical was um, pre-measured, pre-cut, so everything was very much an assembly line. Next slide, please. Those are cots that are ready to be installed that were part of the delivery. Next slide, please. This is the ranch in Loveland, Colorado. Next slide, please. That's our oxygen tank to supply. This is us under construction at the ranch. Next slide, please. We're close to completion, not quite there. You can see the signage. All of it um, coincides with what was done at the convention center. Next slide, please. This is a view of the nurses station at the ranch. Uh, like I said, every facility is slightly different, but um, it was really rather ingenious. Next slide, please. And this is an unfinished area at the ranch. We stepped down when we saw the infection rate slowing. Next slide, please. And this is it. This is the facility complete. Um, one of the interesting things, it, my office will be responsible for returning the facilities back to their original condition um, prior to um, returning it back to the, uh, the landlords. Um, the challenge I see right now is how can we reuse, how can we make the best of the materials that we have after we're done, and how can we, I don't know whether it's through Habitat, through Humanity, what can we design um, with the materials that we have. The way these are built, they will be very easily um, taken down and taken apart, and they are our components. And how will we use the pieces and parts after we're done? So with that, I'll, uh, I'll return it back to Mike. Thank you. Well, thanks, Sherry. That's, uh, that's fascinating. My first question for you, though, is um, have you had time to sleep? <laughs> Actually, um, we've been working about 12 to 18 hour days since March 11th. Um, last weekend was the first weekend I took off. So um, it's, it's been a lot of work, but you know, we're, we're racing against time. We hope nothing we built is, needs to be used, um, but we can't, we can't put that to chance. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize how small your office is. It sounds like a, a really impressive enterprise, right? The, Office of the State Architect, but it's not that many people, and they're being yeah, asked to we, do a heck of a lot. Yeah, we're a staff of eight, and we have, um, there are four architects, two real estate individuals, and then our energy management person and one admin. Everybody has been working very hard. They are incredible. Actually, this is uh, the whole of state government. Um, th there has been, there's sometimes a silo effect in state government, and what this emergency has done is it's torn down walls with that across the state because everybody's on the same goal. Yeah. And this is a brand, essentially a brand new scope of work for your office too. Yes, it is. It is. I had started with the state five and a half months before this happened. So um, this was, um, I had just enough time to get used to my new role, role before this happened. So uh, the people in our office are incredible. They yeah. really are incredible. So I'm, I'm really curious, are there any lessons or practices that you're, you're gleaning from this process that we might see crossover into regular capital and maintenance projects? Um, uh, well, 
if you look at the, if you look, the, the corner bead on those walls was actually duct taped. So I, I hope that doesn't bleed over. Yeah. Um, we, there were shortcuts we took that um, we were, they were ingenious, but they were shortcuts. Actually, I think the, the greatest takeaway for us is the utilization, the way people are. How can they successfully work at home? How, what do they need to support that work? Um, the space planning initiatives of the state, how will we reopen state government? That is, that's actually what's being discussed right now. That will be, we want to be able to provide the service, but we do want to take lessons from this experience and, and do a better job for the people of Colorado. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit. So back to what you thought you, you had signed up for when you took this job. Uh, what's happening on the other state projects? Well, currently, um, everybody is building as fast as they can, and that's the encouragement we've been giving them. Um, for the next um, fiscal year, which will begin July 1, as was mentioned before, the, um, the Joint Budget Committee is doing their final touches on the budget, and um, the Capital Development Committee is re-examining the projects that they had originally thought that they were going to approve. We'll have to see at the, um, you know, as the long bill is introduced, what kind of changes are being made. Uh, the state believes that this will probably impact um, budgets for the next three years at least. So this upcoming fiscal year, um, which is 2021, but it will also impact 21, 22, and 22, 23. So it, it will have a very large effect of, on all of state construction. So the long range plans or the master plans that have been developed will, will probably be influenced both by that factor of the, of the budget impact, but yeah. also by perhaps uh, changes in how we use facilities. That's exactly right, Mike. In fact, we're finding our real estate division is going back and re-examining leases that were uh, negotiated and implemented. Um, probably the biggest example is the Department of Revenue um, because there's no gambling, and so there's no gambling, so that's a cash-funded program. So you have a lot of people there that um, they are not collecting the dollars, so they're not going forward, so those tax revenues are not coming in, so staffing changes. Do you think the real estate footprint that the state and the public universities occupy is gonna shrink? There's a lot of, of, of higher ed education that has to take place. Um, in, you know, in person, like lab work and stuff. Um, so I really can't speak to higher ed. I know that they're looking at it as well. As far as the state of Colorado, yes. I, I think the best thing we could do would be to really sit down and take a statewide utilization study, look at the different uh, functions and what their utilization rates need to be, and then, um, then have a larger conversation, which is, is great because that's gonna be great work for the consultants that, that do that work. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything that you would you would say to the consultants that normally work on these projects? Um, well, other than stay tuned and hang in there. Yeah, I, I think that's true. You know, the, the good news is that a lot of higher ed was going into master planning processes in this last year, particularly CU Boulder, but also Anschutz Medical Campus. There are certain things that are not going to change with the pandemic and the outcome, the, the life after. Um, you know, I, the built environment is important to the economy and to the people of Colorado. And I can't imagine that all these parents that are raising their kids and homeschooling aren't just going to be begging to get back into the office as soon as they possibly can. So that's good news. Yeah, and also begging to send them off to college. Um, <laughs> yes, they, that's right. That's right. <laughs> they may have to celebrate high school graduation at home, but they're definitely wanting to send the kid off. Yeah, but it's wonderful to see the energy and the spirit. People are, they're, they're not stopping. They're moving forward. It's great. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, I definitely got a sense, even in the, in the pictures and the description that you gave of the esprit de corps of people just finding a way to make it happen. Yeah. And when we were working with not only the architects, but the contractors, um, everybody, um, they were so pleased to be able to help and they were so pleased to be able to build something that although it's not the typical architecture that we design and build, it definitely is functional. Well, I'll ask the rest of the panelists to, to come back up and see uh, the smiling faces if you're still there. 
and um, and wrap up with some some other questions. Um, thank you, Sherry, for that portion. Of thank course. you. Um, so uh, before we get to any outside questions, I wonder if you'd like to to speak to each other a little bit about what you what you just saw. Parker, I have a question for you. When you guys are working at DOLA, and, and thank you for the work you're doing, because we've actually worked with you on a little bit of the homeless issue. Um, how, when do you expect to do your next survey and, and how are you approaching it? Um, there's no definitive next survey. Um, we're just trying to figure out lessons learned um, to, you know, it, it came up so quickly right at the beginning that you know, putting a survey together is, is a really f fine art <laughs> to make things uh, understandable and to ask the right questions. So we're trying to get all of that together and we're trying to figure out if we're the best um, organization to put that together. I mean, we've been working with Colorado Municipal League and Special Districts Association and, and, the, and the associations and they've been really helpful as well. Um, so there's just d discussions ongoing, I, I guess is how I'd answer that. Um, but I'd like to see the results when when, it, when it's available. We did do a survey uh, last week, just a very informal, just for our own purposes, of county treasurers, just to see how county treasurers are dealing with property tax collections. And like we expected, property taxes are much more stable than sales tax or severance tax or many of those other categories. Um, some hits to, to collections so far, but um, property taxes are, are predictably relatively stable. Are you so seeing Catherine, data? Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to ask Catherine, if, when you were talking about the parks and the, the design of the exterior urban spaces, are, are you, is anybody talking about doing any kind of planning or initiative behind that? Yeah, I would say everybody is talking about it. It's, um, it's been kind of interesting to figure out how to get it how to get it funded. Um, the EDA just came out with some grants that are looking at um things to kind of keep people working and also retrofit spaces so the question is can we do it with both public and private spaces um i think to to a lot of the stuff that sherry was talking about i think it's been really dramatic to see how private enterprise has really played a very public role in a lot of our response and what we've been able to do and so thinking about how we how we can kind of adjust both of those spaces, both the public and the private. Um, but right now, I think people are really looking at how do we get that funded? How do we bring the different partners together to <clears throat> to do that work? Um, I think it'd be kind of fun to do a design competition around around some of those ideas. And um, part of what we've been working on is the idea of social social entrepreneurship and how we can like facilitate design, facilitate competitions to have people really bring their innovations and adaptations um, to light and, and share that communication with others in, um, in their community as well as around the state. And so thinking about how to have more of those conversations is a big part of where we're headed. I know a couple of people who might be interested in that, by the way. <laughs> Sherry, I'm wondering if, if seeing those images of, of the facilities you put together is really striking. I mean, that, that's quite the accomplishment to get that many beds together. Um, I wonder if there have been any conversations on the timeline of, of how long they'll be available and, you know, without, with so much unknown about the virus, um, that must be hard to, to plan around. When I, when I engaged in the leasing process, I was told to um, extend the leases to end of, of the year. So um, a lot of the leases will expire December 31st. And I'm hopeful that um, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to stand the projects down and start the reconstruction efforts so I can return uh, the facilities back to their original use by mid January. So yeah, there will be work. There will be the, definitely the facilities are probably work. grateful for, for the, that lease revenue. So that's probably not the pressure. They are, but you know, there's, there's, I, I called it COVID denial because when I first started um, negotiating leases, nobody really wanted to um, think that it was going to last that long. 
So I feel like I've done a certain amount of therapy when I was taking facilities through the process and explaining to them what we thought the outcome was going to be of the pandemic. But thank you for asking that. Oh, and one more note on the surveys. Um, so we're likely going to, um, we did our three surveys as a baseline survey. And so we will likely do them again. Um, we don't have a firm date set for it, but we're thinking that in maybe three months or so, um, ours, ours ended just the beginning mid-May, mid-May. So we'll do about three months to kind of see where, where things come out after. Anyway, I'm going to have to sign off to head to another presentation, but thank you all so much for including me, and, um, and let's stay in touch and see how we can work together. Thanks, Catherine. Appreciate your contributions today. Parker, I was curious, are you, are you seeing any um, either, either survey results or hearing things anecdotally about local governments under this financial pressure um, doing furloughs or layoffs of their own staff? Um, well, I just keep thinking about my own situation with the, with the state budget and, and definitely it's, it's, it's definitely in discussion. I know the city of Denver has, I believe, eight furlough days for, for most of their professional staff um, through the end of the year. Um, so, I mean, I would certainly pretty much expect it widespread at some point. Just the, the question is how, um, how drastic, I suppose. Yeah. We've definitely heard of um, seasonal furloughs and layoffs. So, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of park facilities, for example, that, you know, their, their camps aren't going to be open or, or they won't be able to sign up people for the activities right. they would normally do. So they might not hire lifeguards and referees and umpires and all that kind of thing. Yeah, pretty um, much a freeze yeah, on yeah. All, all hiring, um, unless it's, it's a new program that comes from, from legislature or something like that, that, that has to be done by statute. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah. It's, it's not the, I'm not I'm not the biggest optimist on the on the current situation. Yeah, our concern is on the uh, on the building department side. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of those departments and staff functions are are funded by fees that come in uh, on the private side, and if they have to lay off anybody or or decrease their staff capacity to respond to those plan reviews and building per permit applications or construction inspections. And then it will consequently mean there's less of that fee revenue coming in the door. Um, all of the people in our side of the industry will have to slow down or stop working. So we're, we're, we don't want to be insensitive to what is happening at the local level with their revenue, but we also want to make sure that this work keeps going because there are people that want to continue the construction. My, my guess is the effects will be um, different in different locations. Um, lots of places have different policies on reserves. Um, you know, it, it, reserves are great to carry you through a short-term crisis, but this is becoming a longer-term crisis. And with TABOR and voter approval for so many revenue sources and, and um, retaining revenue, um, some places will be in, in different shape than others, e even across a short distance, just based on their you know, kind of ballot history in, at the election box. Well, there's a lot more to sort through uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And, and uh, Sherry, just as you were able to step back the, the construction and the budget on those um, surge facilities, we hope that you'll be able to step back the lease term uh, because we've not only flattened, but turned the curve the right direction. Um, yeah, yeah, I, we're, we're hopeful. I mean, I, there's a resilience the last time I, when I was served in the legislature, when I was on the joint budget committee, it was, it was during the great recession. And what has always amazed me is the resilience of the Colorado economy. Um, and I'm hopeful that once we can all get out there and do the work we do, that it'll swing around pretty fast. Yeah. Better to, to plan for the worst and hope for the best than the other way around though. So, yeah. Um, I would just ask uh, before you close, do you have any, any requests or advice for AIA or our architect members that, that we can help you? Um, well, this is helpful. I mean, I think understanding, I think the community, keeping the community together, it's, it's difficult to run um, a member organization like AIA when you're going through this and, and it's even harder 
um, during a pandemic because you can't gather and you can't have that that um, that collegial support. So I appreciate what you're doing, Mike. I really do. Thank you to you and Megan for setting this up. And, and I was just going to similarly just think about the work that AIA has done over years and all the all the talk about resiliency and preparation. Um, you know, this is just a perfect example of, of why that's so important and just to continue those conversations um, in, in, in the longer term. Yeah, just having offices like yours in place and it, it can be a struggle to make sure they get the support they need from the state and, and we're there to backstop you on those requests and, and make sure that it, especially now they see it as a vital function. Um, memories fade though and um, I'm sure we'll be having conversations somewhere down the road of you know do you really need these people and, and pay them this much and, and we'll be there to say resoundingly yes you do. <laughs> Thank so, you. Thanks for what you're doing to help help all of the citizens of the state of Colorado get through this and come out the other side even better. Um, appreciate you. your contributions and, and uh, if, you, if you think of anything else that we can do to help support you in those efforts, let us know. And we also want to thank the people who participated in the call today. And just a reminder um, that uh, we have another uh, next week, every week, same time, same place, we'll discuss COVID-19 restaurant design. There's a task force of award-winning uh, restaurant design members of AI Colorado who have worked with the Colorado Restaurant Association and CDPHE to adapt the new public health guidelines and, and as restaurants start to open again uh, to be safe and enjoyable places to dine out again. So um, you'll hear more about that next Wednesday and we've got a full lineup uh, every week of programs to participate in and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. Thank you. For, uh, a great talk today. We appreciate it. And have Thank a good you. rest of the week. You too, Mike. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.